the Total War Warhammer campaign map was just released. And I thought I'd take a look at it. I've watched the trailer over at, or the video over at um, the Total War channel. So if you haven't watched it there, watch it, because there was a lot of information. And I'm mainly going to be talking about my impressions on the Warhammer world, because I, th I thought, I think it was Al Bickham, I thought he did a fairly good job explaining what happens on the, what happens on the campaign map, what you see happening. So this is the world, this is the part of the Warhammer world, with the the um, old world right in the center here. There are other parts of the map that are not visible on this particular map. And it suggests that this area is going to be the main focus. We have, uh, we have the area where chaos comes from here, over in Norska. We have... The Badlands, inhabited by the Orcs and Goblins. We have the Empire in the center here. We have the mountains where the Dwarves live. Chaos Wastes on the on the edge there. But then we have the provinces of Istalia, uh, Tilea, and the Border Princes, together with uh, Britonia. And... What I, f I mean, I figured that the provinces of, or the, the lands of the Lizardmen, um, the New World, and uh, Arabia, the lands of the Tomb Kings, wouldn't be in here. But way down south there, I mean, I'm almost hoping, beyond hope, that the, that the, uh, that the Tomb Kings could be in the game at some point, because the very edge of the map is there. I don't think it's going to happen, but it would be really cool if it did, if they could be there like an emergent faction, a horde faction, but it would just be so out of character that I really don't see it happening. Although, it's too bad, because I think the, the Tomb Kings are one of the coolest, coolest um, factions, and definitely in Lustria, the the... The uh, Lizardmen are very, uh, very popular and very cool as well. But I don't think we'll be able to see them. So you know which factions are in the game from before. And I'll just have to address that. The Yes, the Chaos Warriors, one of the essential bad guys, are going to be, are going to be um, day one or pre-order DLC. Which a lot of people don't like. Uh, I've kind of grown jaded by the fact that this is just how Sega and the Creative Assembly does things and I won't waste too much time bothering about liking it or not. Uh, it's a decision each each player has to make. Do you want to get it or don't you want to get it? And that's really the only way of voting, of choosing to put money in the Creative Assemblies as and Sega's collective pockets, or choosing not to do so. Now, in my case, choosing not to do so means that I won't be able to play with the Chaos Warriors, which is something that I want to be able to do. Not necessarily for single player, perhaps, but most certainly for multiplayer. And even if it entertains me for a few hours, it's worth it. I've talked about that before, how computer games give me a lot of fun compared to, say, a movie ticket or other forms of entertainment. But enough of that, so we're, we're looking at the campaign map here, and it kind of looks like a more uh, a more feature-rich Attila, with the fire, the darkness. It's a very fantasy setting, but there's also realism to it. You can see the distinctiveness between the Greenskin armies, the Greenskin settlements, and the Dwarven stronghold here. And I have to say, the map looks good. It looks the way a Warhammer map should look. It looks dark, gritty... It looks lived in, and there is there are distinct differences between the factions. Now here you can see the legendary, or he's not a le uh, is he legendary? I'm not really sure, but uh, we have Musk, the astute, a level eight. Uh, they call them lords in the call them lords in the uh, in the video, but I would I would say war boss or warlord. Boss is more orky. So, Battle Axe of the Lost War gives plus 8% um, eight percent weapon damage. And it's cool that these that you can pick up magical items as you go, because a big part of the Warhammer game is picking the right magical items for your heroes and lords. And that could prove 
uh, that would prove fun for the campaign as well, going into battles and you have both the set battles, the, the custom battles, and you have the uh, chance to drop, apparently you have the chance to drop random loot basically from, from battles that will give you these items. So that could be a lot of fun, customizing your, customizing your uh, heroes for different tasks. There were, of course, items in other Total War titles, Shogun 2, uh, and, and uh, you had different kinds of ancillaries and things for um, items for, for Rome 2 and Attila as well, but it wasn't really fleshed out and they weren't that major. Banner of Rage, Mork's War Banner, Magic Resistance, Increased Magic Resistance. So that's interesting, that Magic Resistance, Magic Damage Resistance is the thing that's in. Uh, it seems that, like the magic, because the way Magical Resistance works in Warhammer is that you have a chance to to dispel uh, spells cast at you. But in this case, it seems like uh, a unit has a chance of removing... Um, significant part of, of magical resistance and I wonder whether or, or magical damage and I wonder whether this is going to be in the campaign uh, or ju just in the campaign or if it's going to be there in for the multiplayer as well because that could be quite important if you could if you were able to you're able to give banners here to your different units and um, let's say you have a very vulnerable a big unit of very expensive melee troops Maybe you could give those guys a banner that would protect them from magic if you're going up against a magic heavy faction. Or maybe you could give them a banner that gives them a higher missile block chance, for example. I don't know yet. But that would be cool, offer some additional uh, additional strategic choices in fitting out your army. Because that's something that I've missed in Rome 2 and in, in Attila. You can't really customize your army other than giving them experience and giving most units experience has been a complete waste and not worth it so bringing back the ability to improve armor weapons uh, experience different banners that could increase morale or the combat effectiveness of a unit i think that's a step in the right direction i only hope it's still available for multiplayer so here we see some dwarven strongholds some orc and goblin strongholds and uh, they look quite, quite cool, I have to say. Ramshackle and just everything you would expect out of a dwarf stronghold. Really distinct, really different from the from the dwarven Karax. But they, it seems to me like there are quite a few settlements in a small area. I, they, they chose to keep in the province system, it seems. The province system that they had for, from, uh, from Rome 2 and Attila. And... I have to say, I do not like the province system whatsoever. And the reason why is because it drives, uh, it drives the player to, it drives the player to conquest. So, uh, steamrolling the AI is always a problem, and I find that the province system means that you get driven to capture entire provinces and not just that one single strategic settlement. And not being able to develop all settlements like you could in, say, in say medieval, uh, where you had no in medieval two, where you had no province system. Uh, I like being able to choose myself which settlements are going to be big and which are not going to be big, and that ties in with them removing the the um, population mechanic. So. Here we have the upgrades for the Goblin Workshop, just standard upgrading, uh, looks quite nice with the different, and I forgot to say it, but the unit unit cards look quite nice as well, with different colors and very stylistic. Um, here you unlock the different different upgrades for your units. Uh, the, the names are of course very orchified with Evi and bigger wheels, uh, stuff like that. You'll find a lot of that. That's very distinct for the for the greenskins. They kind of have a Cockney English uh, dialect. There we have Asag the Slaughterer, a legendary orc lord. Uh, has the crown of sorcery, which is quite special. To my knowledge, he's the only orc war boss that's also a mage because of the crown of sorcery, but it also makes him stupid. So he can have some spells, uh, 
which uh, looks like he can have four spells in the... Yep. Presence, Route Marcher, so some battle some battle skills and some some campaign map skills, some battle skills. Uh, oh, it seems like f uh, four four uh, spells for the first level there, but then they are locked. Um, so I don't know how that's going to work. And that's the quest chain. So if you you can follow the follow the quest chain and apparently unlock things like Skullmuncha, the wyvern of Asai. So now he's unlocked and now he's flying around on his uh, wyvern, and it shows up on the campaign map and it looks pretty cool uh, it gives the it gives the the generals and the war bosses a bit of a presence on the battlefield and it's of course very easy to see where you have your legendary lord if he's the only guy flying around on a big wyvern but overall the look of the I think to very similar to Attila and that kind of fits in terms of the grittiness of the Warhammer world because Warhammer isn't Warhammer is a, the Warhammer world is a dark gritty place it's it's not it's not uh, shiny bright fantasy but you get that with the high elves um, to a certain extent the wood elves but most of the other factions are dark gritty Looks like we're going to take a small trip through the mountain passes of the dwarves here. And the world looks populated. It looks lived in. And there are quite a few... It almost... It reminds me of uh, Heroes of Might and Magic. And there's a little goblin army trapped there. And it has the option to travel underground, apparently. In order to avoid these... In order to avoid these... Um, Dwarfs, and I assume that's only going to be possible if you have a goblin army and it's being led by a goblin. And that offers some interesting strategic possibilities for the potentially weaker goblin armies to be able to show up uh, behind enemy armies, trap them, get out of sticky situations, uh, just completely bypass enemy armies. Because I assume goblin armies are going to be extremely, extremely weak compared to a mixed army of orcs, goblins and the various monsters. Doesn't look like that character is completely texturized. Or he might just be standing in a low light location. But the lighting as well is it's very... Is this, this could be Attila. Just with... This could be a mod for Attila. And... If Total War Warhammer feels like a mod for Attila, uh, I might be a bit annoyed. Because... Um, well, the Call of Warhammer mod was great for Medieval 2, but I don't want to feel like I'm paying full price for a mod. And the way things are looking now, I, I'm kind of anxious that that's going to be the fact. So as you can probably hear, I'm not that, that excited for this yet, the way they've chosen to do the mechanics. So it seems like animosity, I've talked about animosity at length. So basically in, in the Warhammer game, you can have Orc and Goblin units that will just start infighting on the battlefield. They won't do what you tell them to. But in this case, it looks like animosity is going to be an effect that happens on the campaign map, where an army has a chance to defect, start infighting, kill each other. And it's nice that the orcs are purely aggressive, that they have to do something aggressive, and that gives the armies different buffs. But let's just uh, have a look at the... there were some stats here, so orc... orc boys. Morale seems uh, reasonably high here. Um, hard, hard to say anything about the about the other stats and how they relate to each other uh, because we don't know the, the stats but they uh, we don't know the stats of the other but it, it seems like like the the charge bonus here is on the low side and uh, I mean the, these these stats here I see that they have some buffs but these stats are in uh, from what I can tell, they are 
with weapon damage of 36, a health of 120 and 67 base morale, if the combat mechanics are anything like they were in Attila and, and Rome 2, it seems like combat is going to take quite a while, especially since even the orc boys have a low charge bonus like that. And so the goblins as well, uh, low melee attack, low defense, 30 weapon damage, 20 armor, and 57 morale even for the goblins here. Uh, let's see, the archers have only 13 missile damage, 90 range, 110 ammunition. So I don't know whether these stats are going to be in the game. 20 missile damage for the orcs, 125 range. And they are taking some liberties here because the... Um, it seems like they are, they are using much shorter ranges than the ranges present in the present in the tabletop game, but we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, here we have the chariot, 22 charge bonus, uh, 24 health, that must surely be the health of the wolves. So I don't know how meaningful it is to be talking about the stats at this point, because they could be subject to change, simply don't know that yet, it, this is alpha. But it should give an indication of where they are going with the stats. So the Boar Boys Biggums, charge bonus 35, 60 health. Uh, and once again, the health values don't really make sense to me at this point. You would expect cavalry units to have more health than... Uh, but, but, but they might have separated the health for rider and mount, that might be the case. So you have the, you have the rider, mount, uh, rider health and the mount health, and then they are have to be reduced to zero combined in order for the the unit to be dead but once again uh, 30 weapon damage 35 charge 60 armor it seems like the stats so far are kind of tilted towards defense but we'll see so the, uh, they apparently started uh, started raiding a bit here and that that reduced animosity made them a bit happier As a, uh, an orc shaman drawing in some uh, on the winds of magic, producing the potency of enemy spellcasters in the area, apparently. And there's also the ability, when, a, when an army feels really confident, it can draw upon the power of the war, which apparently creates, um, creates an sh army that follows it, an AI army that you can give limited orders to, which... I mean, I would have preferred the war to be kind of, kind of like a crusade, but where you, uh, where you can control, you can actually control the armies, but they need to keep fighting in order to, they need to keep fighting in order to not be disbanded. And that, of course, only the faction leader would be able to call upon the war. So, Grimgor Ironhide is scouting. There he is, Grimgor Ironhide, the legendary orc. Grimgor is the best. Going up towards his uh, his custom battle there. So let's see here. Walking towards Blackfire Pass, a murderous red gleam in his eye, and any boys reckless enough to come near, hear him growling, I'm gonna stomp him to dust, I'm gonna grind their bones, I'm gonna pile them up in a big fire and roast them, I'm gonna bash heads, break faces, and jump up and down on a bit that are left, and then I'm gonna get really mean, yeah, so that's a fairly well-known quote for the people who are nerdy enough to play Warhammer, um, and the objective's fairly simple, just win, Brimgor gets 15 experience and gets Nick. Which uh, git is git means to something like dude or guy, and snick is to kill. So gits git dude killer. <laughs> and there you can see the uh, you can see the um, the agents there are in, they are in the in the army, the warrior priest and the wizard. I hope we will be able to bring agents to the 
Battlefield in multiplayer as well. That would be a nice addition, I think. So you could choose between going magic, combat. Again, different different tactical different different tactical considerations. Is the enemy going to bring a mage at all? Is he just going to not bring magic and focus on shooting? Is he going to bring flyers? I hope it, it brings a more diverse multiplayer experience, and I hope they don't just shove multiplayer to the side like they did with Attila and Rome 2. But of course, knowing the Creative Assembly, they only really did multiplayer extensively for Shogun 2, and after that they haven't done it. So since they are focusing on Arena now, I think it's highly unlikely that they're going to really flesh out the multiplayer of Total War Warhammer. And here we have the Chaos Wastes, the Winds of Magic blowing strong. Or, or Norska, I guess. Yeah, this is Norska. This is not the Chaos Wastes. But behind behind Norska should be the Chaos Wastes, further to the north. Here we have uh, the Norska settlements lined up one by one. A few Dwarven strongholds up there as well. So these are the Dark Lands from where the legions of death, destruction and chaos come. And of course, looking at the map with this camera, the map looks grand. Certainly better than the map is going to look when we look at it. But uh, settlements seem to be very, very close. It seems like you could reach a lot of settlements from your own settlement in a single turn of walking. And so the, the map feels a bit cramped, to be honest. The map, from what I can see now, the map looks to be small, cramped. Uh, and up in the mountains, of course, there are going to be mountain passes and it's going to be very cramped. So it, I guess it kind of has to be that way for the dwarves to be able to uh, hold the green skins at choke points and stuff like that. But it will be interesting to see how the the goblin tunneling mechanic works, and I will of course be playing the game when it comes out. But seeing this, uh, seeing this uh, in alpha stage and the direction they're going with it, I can't say that I am that excited for it. But of course, you wouldn't expect me to be excited about uh, just seeing the campaign map. I'm going to be really excited about the battles, seeing the battles, seeing custom battles. So I hope they will show us battles between two actual live human beings uh, and that's something that I would uh, get excited over potentially. So that's it, the campaign map, strength and honor.